Welcome back to another mostly monthly podcast here in the Levity Zone. If you haven't noticed, we are in a number of renaissances in our world. The art of the spoken word is making a comeback thanks to podcasts. The science of the big cosmos and the very tiniest of particles are both blossoming. And virtual reality, or VR, has made its way back onto the tech stage. VR got its start in the 1980s with Jaron Lanier and other colorful characters. It experienced a horrible death by about 1994, however, as the early makers and adopters fell into the proverbial chasm. Then in 2012, VR made its second coming with a little crowd-funded effort called Oculus. Oculus and its headset, the Rift, was purchased by Facebook just two years later for a stunning two Bs. That's two billion dollars, folks. This catapulted the medium into the spotlight, and today, at the end of 2016, there are many new devices and some breathtaking new experiences being tried out on the unsuspecting masses. My own personal history with VR started around 1990 when I tried the VPL headset and glove, designed by Jaron Lanier. I went on in 1995 to help catalyze the coming of virtual worlds, inhabited by people as avatars, as a kind of counterexample to VR. In our virtual worlds, you, one, didn't need a headset, and two, could enter and build worlds together on ordinary PCs connected by dial-up to the Internet. These worlds had their own flowering till about 2000, and then fell into a winter period. Thawed by 2005 with the appearance of new platforms like Second Life. So when VR was making its recent return, I was contacted by teams making documentary films. It seems there is an insatiable appetite for graying older guys and gals to act as talking heads for the price of a cup of coffee. This next podcast was recorded during such an interview by a team making a documentary called VR the Movie. I was interviewed along with Galen by Zach Yankovic and his partners at the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies, where our good friend Dr. Skip Rizzo has his lab. Skip is one of the pioneers of early 90s VR, still carrying on work successfully treating PTSD for soldiers and others. I hope to bring Galen's interview and more about Skip into a future podcast. But let's get going now on this wide-ranging conversation on the struggles, triumphs, and prognosis of a new medium trying to be born again. We're good. Cool. So how did you first get involved with VR? Well, it actually started in the 70s when I was a teenager because I was so bored in school that I created worlds of the imagination. And then I started drawing them, you know, in vivid color. All these cartoon worlds, space worlds. It was the era of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So I became sort of an inhabitant of those spaces. So when I first encountered computers and started programming them in 81, that was my goal all the time, was to create an internal virtual landscape, a game-playing landscape, lunar exploration landscape. Computers couldn't do this at the time. So I then waited, and I went into the first job that I could in the mid-80s that allowed me to do stuff with pixels on the screen. And then I stepped into SIGGRAPH, I went into the SIGGRAPH Electronic Theater and put on a head mount display from VPL and experienced those sort of shaky, single user, but interesting reality, you know, not at all like my imagination, you know, fairly low res, fairly buzzy, fairly shaky, but fascinating. So that could have been about 89.90. And so Tell me about that first experience and what thoughts maybe might have been going through your head at that time. Were you, did you immediately notice that this is going to be big? Well, the initial thought that I had was I wasn't too impressed with it. I was impressed with the fact that I could move my hand out with the VPL glove and I could see my hand and sort of manipulate. But there was something missing and something wrong 
with the environment, with the whole experience, the whole setup. There's just something wrong. Um, now, I didn't get sick like a lot of people did. But then about a year later, I read Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. And in Snow Crash, Stevenson projected this concept of the metaverse with avatars and people walking around in a social scene. And I thought, that is it. You know, this very uh, lone journey through these milky graphical spaces is not it. I mean, you do it a few times, but there's nothing there. Someone famous once said that the internet is about people. It's about relationship. So I felt with the passion that when VR went from a solo experience and it went on to screens with an unencumbered interface, i.e. computer screens connected to the internet where you could be social and you could have Stevenson's avatars, then it would take off and it would explode. So walk me through a little bit of the history of VR or what you know about how VR developed in those early days and, you know, everything that took place basically in, up until that point you walked into VPL. You'll get people who do a better history than, than I do, but about 10 years ago, Jaron Lanier and I got together writing a proposal for NASA and he told me his story. Now his story was he was this genius little kid he architected and built his father's house. I think it was a dome or something. But they had no money. They were desperately poor in New Mexico. So then he did anything for money, including being a midwife. And one day he was a midwife, helped deliver a baby. And instead of getting paid, a guy gave him an old car. A car in such bad shape that Jaron describes that you could look through the holes in the floor at the highway. And he got in that car and he drove to Silicon Valley. And to my mind, that's the apocryphal, mythical story about the whole modern beginning of VR was when he got in that car. And then he got to Silicon Valley and he was going to decide what to do. And he could have done a lot of other things, but he decided on this idea of the virtual space and the glove design, you know, and then the HMD and things like that. And then Jaron sort of slipped into that. And he became, of course, the great figure of, of that early uh, VR boom. So in some sense, it's that he got this car, he got a means to journey, a means to get to where his vision could be realized. Uh, and that, that when he got on that road, that's when the VR boom kind of commenced. So how would you define VR? You know, there's many definitions. Virtual reality would be, in a sense, a computer-mediated, consensual, immersive space. Immersive in, in the sense that you feel you're in it so that when you are navigating these worlds, you feel like your body's there. You react to things as though your body was there. Um, so the outside world kind of disappears for a little bit. Now, of course, isn't a movie watching a good movie VR or reading a good book? To some extent it is, but this is all about the visual cortex. It's all about suspension of disbelief and the sudden pulling in to a, a new world. Do you think that VR requires a head-mounted display in order for it to be achieved? What is VR? You know, where are we? We're at, a, we're at a, a fulcrum point. So we have the internet coming in and the document-based web, which I wasn't that interested in because I'd been in computing with documents for years and writing softwares, so just more pages. But the idea of a shared space, an agora, where people could meet other people and build things, build cities and whatnot, Stevenson Snow Crash. But I knew it would never work with the head-mounted displays. I knew that it had to come to the common screen. And if you look back exactly 100 years before, Edison, the great inventor, had created the kinetoscope to distribute movies. And the kinetoscope was a stand-up box that you put your head in these eyepieces. You put the earbuds in for the sound, which had a phonograph cylinder and then you watched a two-minute short on 50 feet of movie film. That was Edison's idea for distributing the movies. Of course, people broke away from him, you know, under penalty of lawsuits and patent battles, and they created the projector that projected movies onto a big screen, which then allowed it to be a social experience unencumbered by hardware and immerse the people that way. And so I felt this is what was going to happen to VR that the VR of the early 90s was the Edison kinetoscope. And that 
we were going to enter an era where suddenly it would explode onto everyone's screens, which happened in 1995. Suddenly you went from VR, which had already faded by then, and you had this explosion of virtual worlds. Initially they called them like desktop VR, trying to make the term fit. It's like horseless carriage. And then a group of us got together, formed an organization, and held conferences, and we decided that these are virtual worlds. A uh, virtual world in that they're a world full of people and activities. It's like the planet. It's not just a reality, it's a world. It's populated, it's peopled. So that exploded. So VR, in a sense, uh, melted away as a medium, but emerged as a virtual world. Surprisingly and interestingly, these virtual worlds were not sourced in the VR community. They were sourced in the online gaming community. So Duke Nukem, you know, Doom, all these things proved that an IBM PC-compatible 386 could run a 3D real-time space, a single-user space. And so everybody by 1994 knew that you could connect those spaces. So really virtual worlds, which then became Second Life, and online multiplayer games came out of that tradition, not out of VR. It was sourced out of a different tradition. And I jumped in in 1994, 95, I decided, okay, I read Snow Crash, I drank the Kool-Aid, it's time to ramp up an organization, which was the Contact Consortium, to get all the people together and all the community together, convene it as this thing grew. And we held our first conference in 96 called Earth to Avatars, and then five, six, seven more conferences as this thing grew, as the explosion grew. So in a sense, there was the VR wave and then the virtual worlds wave, followed by, in the virtual worlds wave, online multiplayer gaming. And then there was the virtual worlds winter. The VR winter had started earlier, 94, 95. The virtual worlds winter kicked in around 2000, and then it reemerged again with Second Life. So there's all these threads, and now we're seeing the VR, you know, spring, the second coming of VR. So it's fascinating to see these threads. So take me back in time when you tried out VR and what did you think would be the future and forget everything you've learned past maybe 95. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, what did you think this would be? When I tried out VR, I felt the format's wrong, but this would be one of the greatest tools for the human mind and for humanity to explore options, future options. So I was very interested in space. So I thought, you could train astronauts in here. You could design moon bases in here. You could teleoperate with a joystick and an immersive system. You could operate a rover on Mars in here. It's a prosthetic for the mind. It's a prosthetic for a mind. You could even go down to the very small, operate nano equipment. You know, this is what this is. It's like putting glasses on that allow the mind to be connected to a whole universe, and it would be tremendously empowering. So when you started out, what were some of the challenges uh, that you noticed immediately with building virtual worlds and, and kind of combined spaces? Well, the interesting thing is the, the five years between when I tried the VPL system and when Worlds Chat came online, which is just me in front of my computer moving around a space station and people interacting, the graphics were better in Worlds Chat than in the VR system. But the key thing always was, what do you do with this? What do you do with this? So Duke Nukem, Doom, all those systems, completely understandable. First-person shooters, there's a whole market for that. It started with Maze War in the 70s on the ARPANET. Huge market through the 80s, the arcade movement, then the home computer game movement, completely understood that would be an application. There wasn't enough firepower to do that on the internet until about the late 90s. But what do you do? What do you do in here? And I think VR fell upon that sword earlier on because it had you know, very few users, very high cost, specialized hardware, and though they explored a wide application space, but nobody could see it. It was before the internet. So no one knew the kind of art they were doing, the kind of medical, psychological applications they were doing. They were doing it was on TV shows and in magazines. But in virtual worlds, everything we did 
was in public. We could do a virtual university experiment and people would come in in their avatars and build a classroom. Kids from all over the world built a floating city called Sky City as a collaborative project. It blew their teachers away that they had done this. You know, you could hold conferences, meetings, you could help counsel people with cancer. Because it was networked, because it was online, there were possibilities, much more than the first generation of VR. But always the problem is 3D environments are hard to build. They're hard to master. You know, if you look at the average YouTube video, many of them are watchable, but they're not pro and, and slick. Same thing with 3D. You need to have a combination of architecture, space design, sonic design. Uh, you need to have the social thing down. Who greets you when you come in? It's like, this is a nice building that we just came in, but we could wander around it for half an hour. If there's no one to meet here, there would be no point to be here. So this has been the conundrum with virtual worlds and VR. But virtual worlds solved it by making it public. Now, perhaps in the next generation of VR, they will have solved that because it's networked now. There are people there. So all the dreams of science fiction passed from Snow Crash to uh, Minority Report and all that can come true because you have networked your VR finally. Tell me a little bit about the group of people back in that time. Who, you know, who are these early kind of ragtag group of individuals who really saw that this is going to be a big thing, the people that felt the same way that you felt about it. In the virtual worlds, it was a real ragtag group, but it included people like Michael Heim, who was at Art Center College of Design, uh, professors at Cornell, um, truck drivers from Holland, mechanics from Australia, you know, ordinary people. An architect from England would come in and do his architecture thing, because he could. It was the new kind of a paintbrush. Um, somebody who was good at counseling the sick uh, would come in and just start doing that, and people would come to them because it was an agora, it was a meeting place. So it was a total cross-section. People spent enormous amounts of time there because these virtual worlds were social and constructive. They weren't gameplay environments. So it wasn't like going to a theme park or a, a shootout gallery like in the multiplayer gaming spaces where you had to be a certain role. You came in there as yourself or as who you wanted to be. And that's still true with environments today like Minecraft, you know. That's a social constructivist place. So whole families meet in there. My friend has many grandchildren and they have built a family space constructed world and he meets his grandchildren there. It's exactly the same modality as Alpha World in the 1990s or Second Life in 2005, in Minecraft today. So it's this through line of what people do. So I think in a sense, now you've got these rich screen worlds, so immersive VR returns, but the head mount display still has the same social stigma. Does it still have the same nausea-inducing factors? I don't know. Google Glass failed in the market, just glasses. So there's, there's something there that isn't working. We'll see it with Oculus Rift. We'll see if it overcomes social stigma and if it overcomes the limitations of those early low-hanging fruit applications of first-person shooters and sort of experiential game environments. You know, does it break through? Does it allow people to be social? Was the killer app on the internet is still people. That's what we've learned through Facebook and LinkedIn. The killer app is people. So it has to get that. What I've seen so far with the new generation of VR, not a lot of designers in there, not a lot of people who understand experience, social management and the building of space and the creation of an event like a spectacle. Not a lot there. It may be that they're generating stuff that you might have seen in the mid-90s still. So they have to grow up fast in a sense if they're going to make it go. So what do you think caused the winter and what was taking place during that time while VR was, you know, quote-unquote, laying dormant? Well, the VR winter was clear. You know, by 1994, the companies had gone through that curve. It was classic. So they were in the winter. The virtual world's winter started around 2000, 2001 with the dot-com crash, took out a lot of the companies. Boom. They were gone because the whole tech industry collapsed. 
And that winter lasted three or four years. And then I remember being invited to go to Second Life's offices, there.com. Adobe had an environment. I was hired by Adobe. And so 2003, 4, 5, Virtual Worlds kicked back in. And they've been powering along ever since. So I think that the Virtual Worlds winter was the first generation of companies that just got swept away by the dot-com bomb. But the meme was out there. People understood, oh, shared space on your screen. That's a no-brainer. There's all these people who are what I call world-struck. You know, they're completely enamored of the medium without understanding it. And they powered up the next generation of companies within three or four years. And, you know, Time magazine was featuring Second Life on the cover by 2005, six. I mean, it was all sort of back again, although nobody had that much memory of the previous first generation of virtual worlds. I did a talk at Second Life, I was invited to do that, and I asked in the staff how many people were in the first generation of worlds, like uh, the Palace or Alpha World, and half the people there put their hands up. So the people who were, were working, including the founders, had tried those first generation, kicked the tires, and said, oh, we can do this better, which is, is great. It's like the early automobile, like Henry Ford probably kicked the tires of cars from the 1890s, like the Electra, and said, oh, I can do this so much better. So that first generation that cut their teeth, that, that made the medium, that extended it out to the boundaries, they almost never go on to be the commercial successes. It seems to be a rule of a technology, and especially a new medium. It's just a rule. Like the kinetoscope and all that, Edison did not become a great film studio, even though they made all the, the first films and they produced and patented all the equipment to do it. Edison did not become a filmmaker. He did not become Cecil B. DeMille. So Edison was out of the picture by 1915 when Cecil B. DeMille was making his first great films. And this is even before sound. So the emergence of film is a really good metaphor and previous example of how graphical environments, VR, virtual worlds, augmented reality, so that cycle, you can map it to the history of film. Did you think at that time, you know, during the dot-com crash and during those days when uh, you just saw companies kind of failing for one after the other and it not kind of grabbing hold of the masses, did you think that VR might not be able to come back? So <clears throat> there's something else that happened which was interesting. Um, I was going to be taking a meeting with James Cameron, the, the director, because he was very interested in the stuff we were doing in space for NASA. We're using virtual worlds to model space station construction, missions to Mars, you name it. So I was going to take a meeting with him, and it just never happened. But then I heard that his new film, which was sort of a secret project in Hollywood, was going to be called Avatar, which was interesting. He knew what I was doing, so I actually gave one of my Avatar books to his producer, and I signed it from one Avatar to another, good luck with the film. So I thought, this is great. This is going to put some juice in, in the concept of an Avatar somehow. I didn't know what the film was about. So it was given to Cameron, and when the film came out, I thought, wow, he really nailed it. This film is a future vision of where virtual worlds and VR and augmented reality all meet not because of the content of the film, but because how the film was made. With the full capture suits, with the virtual camera, where the director can see the real action behind a real-time render of the scene when they're on the dragon, they're flying on the dragon. And so Cameron had invented an entire technology. He had invented the holodeck, basically. He had invented the holodeck in order to make this film. So when the film came out, I was interviewed in a few places, and I said, Avatar is the future of this technology because it would allow you unencumbered to be in a magical space somehow with VR or probably with augmented reality, but the space is then rendered onto screens that you can see, and somehow the home holodeck may be coming, and it's coming from this movie called Avatar. It's just amazing. So when did you realize that it's going to make a comeback and, and then you saw it and you kind of walk me through the things that you saw take place that really helped lay the foundation of, I guess, the next phase? Well, virtual worlds and massive multiplayer games were off and running, despite the fact there was a three or four year winter for social virtual worlds. 
you know, you had Ultima online, eventually we had World of Warcraft, and we had this huge industry, no problem there. So that industry, in a sense, drove the development of the hardware technology, the, the 3D graphics, the GPUs. You know, it developed all that technology. So that powered the whole thing up. So by 2010, 11, 12, when we see Oculus being developed, they could use the chipsets, even the libraries from that movement that had started after VR crashed in the 90s. The virtual worlds and the multiplayer games had developed all the technology. We're in a building with an institute from USC based upon that technology, game technology mostly. And so that thing that really had started in the arcade movement of the 70s is the real source of all this driver because if you can't get the technology cheaply, you can't do anything. So something like Oculus, which packs so much tech and chips and rendering libraries and whatnot and layers into their headset or the future systems from Microsoft and everybody else that do AR, those miniaturized chipsets come from this industry. So in a sense, VR and virtual worlds and gaming and whatnot are all underlain by this caterpillar that's getting ever better and more legs. And here we are in the mid-teens, and we can do all this stuff. So I think it's going to follow the track of everything else. The telephone was wired, it became mobile, became more social, it was initially a big brick. Then it was a little, a little thing, and then it had a screen interface, and it was totally networked, you know, because people don't realize that cell phones weren't really connected, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And now they're slimmer and smaller, and some of them bigger, but they'll end up becoming watches, becoming glasses, becoming augmented reality. And if you want to know where the future is, read Werner Vinge's Rainbow's End you know, this science fiction book set in San Diego in 2029, and it's a great novel of AR. Science fiction writers always show you the future, and this book shows you an incredible vision for how AR might work. And what AR is, it's a blend of everything. You're looking through a system that may be projecting directly on your retina, the epiphany system. And when you look at the world, you see data, characters, shapes of mountains, virtual worlds, games, the cop car that's behind the next building, you can see it through the building because the AR glasses are like your x-ray glasses of the past. And social stuff is coming in, very much like a heads-up display for a fighter pilot or an astronaut in a spacesuit. So anything in that field of view is going to be projected. You know, so that's the new screen in a sense. You know, I think this is going to become reality, but it's our kids that are going to be doing this, or our grandkids, and they're going to say we're not literate, which is one of the themes in Rainbow's End, which is this guy comes out of a coma decades later, and he has to be sent to a junior high school to work with kids because he's not literate anymore. He doesn't wear. He doesn't have an epiphany system. So is that where it's going? I don't know. I mean, people have an insatiable need for experience and data and place and social interaction. So any technology that comes that feeds that in a well-designed, packaged way is going to be successful. The iPhone did it, you know, for our era. That could go into something in the future where instead of walking along the street looking down at your hand, you're just going to be looking around and it's all mapped onto the world. Isn't that where this is all going? And then that's the common screen in which your games are projected, your next date is projected, <laughs> you know, your design for your spacecraft is projected, data about the weather, stuff like that. Hollywood shows us that this is the way and science fiction shows us this is the way. So will this become reality? I think probably it will in some ways. But I, th I think the immersive displays like Oculus are probably specialized. You know, for example, if you had an AR system, instead of putting on a head mount display that blocks out your peripheral vision and all that, what if you just have your AR system, you dial it up so that you become immersed somehow. It's projecting on your retina. You know, it doesn't allow you to do it while you're driving, you know, that kind of thing. But you, you dial it into full immersion mode or when you walk into your home holodeck in 2032, you, you, your whole thing gets smoky, you know, sort of like uh, 
the holodeck in Star Trek The Next Generation. It gets smoky, you're immersed, and now you're in a space, but you can move physically, and you're in some kind of fantastical world doing your thing. Isn't that an obvious thing? That's Avatar. And we're, I think, maybe halfway to that at this point. What do you think might be some of the negative sides of, of VR? You know, there's a lot of people that become very addicted to Second Life and become very addicted to living in a virtual world. So what are some of the things that you think could be of issue going forward and how might uh, you know, VR transition itself, work things out so that these issues uh, don't stop it again? Spending all this time in front of a screen, what does it take you away from? It takes you away from physical sensation, knowledge of the body, uh, in a sense health, and social interaction, but you might say, well, you're getting your social interaction. But I think in a sense it puts you in a world that is primarily driven by the visual cortex and by stimulus response, by adrenal drivers, you know, cortisol squirts. Primatologists tell us that in our ancestors on the plains of Africa, when the eyes dart back and forth, that's when they were looking for carnivores, for predators, or for prey, you know, that rapid eye movement. So if you do rapid eye movement and you have a lot of mental cortical stimulation, you're driving the same adrenal system that our ancestors used for survival. So people can end up in adrenal shock. Antonio Damasio here at USC has written the best books about this and done clinical studies of this. They call it being wired, right? But as you get older, it gets harder and harder on the system uh, to the fact that screens are the visual field of little kids not the eye contact of the parents or the social cues of the environment. Does this affect early childhood development? Are those kids going to become autistic just because they've looked at pixels more than people? You know, even though people are available through pixels. So I think it's going to be a, a fundamental change in brain architecture potentially from this. I call it the giant unplanned experiment on you. You know, and on all of humanity. It's this huge unplanned experiment on humanity that we're doing without kind of thinking about it. You know, previous generations had worried about books, people who read books too much, that they would be cut off from reality. And automobiles cut us off from each other. You know, automobiles are these artificial virtual environments. You know, back at the caves of Lascaux where the shaman lit the caves with a tallow wick, and told the story of the hunt or of the celestial dynamics of the universe. That was an amazing immersive environment you know, 20, 30,000 years ago. And we, we crave that, I think. You know, in the caves of Lascaux, I would argue, if you were there and in that culture, with that shaman, with all those incredible paintings, that was one of the peak moments in the history of VR. Uh, those cave environments, those immersed environments, you know, surrounded by nature, surrounded by your culture, surrounded by dripping water and whatnot. And maybe we're trying to get back to that peak environment they already experienced for 100,000 years. But how, how might you see the future of VR uh, having a positive impact on humanity? I think the future of VR, it's, it's the traditional double-edged sword. And it's a really powerful sword. So it can cut one way in terms of isolation, in terms of developing a new kind of person that may not be as effective, that may have some social issues or some psychological issues, it, it may cut that way. We don't know. Where it cuts on the positive is the same things that I saw when I first put on the VPL head mount, which was, oh my God, this is a prosthetic for the mind and maybe for the heart as well. And we can live our dreams because we can make them manifest through this technology. And once those worlds become worlds of wonder, where we go, <gasps> and we're just taken away, we've really done it. We have done a high art. Remember the Robin Williams film of years ago where he lives in a painting. He's actually in a painting, and there was this field of flowers, and he starts slipping in the field of flowers, and they kind of smush because they're made out of oil paint. That was an amazing scene. And I'm thinking when you have a virtual world like that, we're going to be able to go to places that just open us up to new realities. No need for drugs, 
no need for years and years of, of meditation. Now, but the problem is, how do you manage those realities, those wondrous realities? Do they become normal? Do they become garden variety and pedestrian? We lose our sense of wonder. Like we've lost our sense of wonder for nature if we drive in a car and see it through a windscreen. Uh, or can we just keep upping the ante? So that's for the art side. For the social interaction side, you could represent a human being in all kinds of ways, not just you sitting here in a baseball cap, me sitting here, us nodding. There's a lot of bandwidth going on, but what if your avatar was incredibly rich? You had body implants that showed me what your heart and mind state was, and your entire family, your history was sort of flowing around you, and I could see this beautiful thing that you are. Your avatar represents something so much bigger, and then when I take off the VR, it's just a guy there in a baseball cap, you know. So maybe it's an enrichment of communication between humans. And the same thing, if we want to study the origin of life, if we want to go to Mars, we can send our robots, tiny and big, and we can go there, and we might be able to crack the mysteries of the universe. You know, what if the James Webb telescope, which is going up in 2018 in, in three years, it's going to look back at when the universe lit up for the first time, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. What if some future astronomer who's a kid today uses that instrument, a huge telescope in space, to actually go with their mind, engage the data, and see how the cosmos began, what made the Big Bang. They put their mind together with this camera, this lens back in time, and through this incredible technology and virtual reality, they see how the universe began. Wouldn't that be something? So it's an amazing double-edged sword. So we've got to watch this one, and we have to be good designers and not do schlocky things. If you go back to film, the great directors arrived in the mid-teens. Right about now, 100 years ago, the great directors from DeMille and others. Of course, they were making 30-minute trains going off of trestles, but they started making dramatic pieces. And this is before color and before sound and when the film quality was low. And of course, there's all this cheap stuff. You know, there's all the Keystone Cops, all the easy things to get the audiences for. But then film went through a transition Sound came in 1927, 28, and then that opened up a whole new dimension. Human beings are now really representable through voice, music, and then color came in the mid-30s. And then there was an incredible evolution that happened in films that are made in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all kinds of themes opening up the human dimension, the human heart, human vision, the best storytelling we've ever seen has been done through this medium. So this may be the future of VR, just track how the movies developed. So we have a previous example, and it's a really good example, and we have to live up to that level that they did. Beautiful. Do you have any questions, Daniel, that you wanted to throw in? Yeah, just one little uh, topic to, to cover. Uh, yesterday we were talking with Skip, and he, he mentioned how there's this whole new young generation that seems to be walking right into this, Whereas these pioneers have been in this game for so long, and they've been struggling to see the birth of VR, and, and now it seems to be happening. And I just want to know what your thoughts are on that, and seeing how this young generation seems to be kind of walking into it, where it's almost, it's ready to go, the technology's there, whereas you guys have been working on this for so mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it's wonderful that it's come back in this way. I mean, this generation that's walking into it are gamers. Let's face it, you know, the people who created Oculus wanted a better experience and they knew they could crack that nut. They could get rid of the motion jitter and, and all the, the technologies. And so they're coming from that tradition, but then they're hauling in all their other young generation that have lived in a social world uh, online who understand the current technologies. And so I think they are really going to push it to the next level. I think we've got a a run of about four or five years of this, and they'll push it to the next level. Will they push it over the transom, over the tipping point, where it becomes the next medium of interaction? It's hard to say. I would think not. I would think that we're still stuck in some metaphors. Unless we get, like the great Cecil B. DeMille of that period is going to take that up and say, no, this is good design, this is good interaction practice, 
this is good marketing. We're going to push it over the limit. Are we there? We don't know. The first generation of cell phones that tried to do the web were pretty bad, right? Then we got the iPhone, which pushed us over the top. So you have this phase change, and every phone has now going to become a smartphone. When does every smartphone and every computer screen, when does it become an interface up here? This is the ultimate in tipping point. And I think we're not going to see that until the 2020s. We're going to see a, a third wave of VR that is AR, that is virtual worlds, that is data, that is Google Maps, that is Facebook, that is all blended. We're going to see that convergence, but I think it's the 2020s because the same mistakes are being made in, in the current VR, the same things it's falling into. The technology is better, but maybe out there there's this young Cecil B. DeMille that will do it, that will crack it and make it into a mainstream popular medium through good design, good storytelling. I'm glad you said that, because I mean, a lot of the goal with this is to put a film out there that maybe that young guy might see, that might say, oh, well, now that they've kind of shown me the potential of this mm -hmm. technology. The young guys should talk to the older guys and, and see the state of the art you guys are doing. I mean, you guys are canvassing it. Maybe the extended version of what you produce will reach that community. This is what this is. Cecil B. DeMille didn't get to be a genius in what he did by just coming new into it. He probably attended a lot of theater. He wrote scripts in the previous medium, which was theater, acting, all that. And he did all that. He had to in order to do what he did with this awkward new medium of film to set it up properly. Here's a really good example, and I'll finish. In the Black Mariah, which was the studio that Edison ran, it was set up as this funny-looking tar paper building. It was all set up as a tiny little black box theater. So everything that Edison did was like, you're sitting in the stands, and blah, 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 and there's people up there. The camera never moved, right? Because they didn't understand what the medium was they were dealing with. Well, when people got hold of that medium away from that initial rigid approach, and we could think that Doom is the rigid approach to VR, and they created the first close-ups. So this is now when film is in theater, close-ups between two lovers. You know that that had such impact that people fainted. According to the news of the time, women could faint right in the theater because it was so dramatic. The camera moved close in suddenly. Huge. So somebody broke out of the mold of the first obvious thing to do. So the first obvious thing to do in VR has been first-person shooters. We have to break out of that mold to do something else like film did. So hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great. I hope, I hope it happens. <laughs> I think it will. It's, uh, yeah, and I think it's the next 10 years we're going to, we'll see this wave come and sort of blow over, and then we're going to see a third one, I think. 2020s. So read, read Rainbow's End. Okay. Will do. Will do. <laughs> It'll totally light you up. You know, like, oh my God, that's an incredible vision. You know, like Snow Crash was in 1991 for me for online avatar virtual worlds. Rainbow's End, I think, is a vision for AR, VR, you'd call it, uh, for this time. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Levity Zone. My skepticism of the prospects for VR may be softened somewhat by the fact that I am now getting involved in it in a really creative way. I am working with fellow podcaster Duncan Trussell to attempt to record the first podcast inside a VR world. And we won't be using just any old world. We are planning to meet inside the most spectacular visionary landscapes by another friend, Android Jones, working now to ready his Vive world called Microdose VR for multi-user habitation. Beyond this, I hope to work with Android at another big festival in 2017 to bring the follow-on to Fire in the Sky to a big stage with real-time triggering of VR brushes and worlds. VR may be one of the most creative new spaces for the arts in generations, and we might just be able to bring storytelling in-world along with it. Thanks to the crew from VR the Movie for agreeing to provide this audio, 
and find a link to their site on the Levity Zone page for this podcast, number 52. Great thanks go to Slugware for his beautiful ambient track, Here Is Now, which we used in our intro, and you will hear more of next. The cover art for this show was shot by yours truly within a historic virtual world, Avatars 2000, an Avatar cyberspace odyssey. The active world space which hosted our third fully cyber conference 16 years ago. If you take a look at this screenshot, you will see me frowning into a live webcam while my avatar, DigiGardener, flits past with a smiling photo of me plastered onto a beringed cube. We had hundreds of users in those events, and they were truly pioneering days and it might just be possible to bring the power of community back to VR in our time. So stay tuned.